Hi, and welcome to FBC Lloyd's YouTube channel. It's our hope that God will speak to you through the message that you're about to watch. If you'd like to know more about our church, you can check us out online at www.fbclloyd.ca or you can find us on Facebook and Instagram. If you have an Apple, Windows, or Android phone, you can download our free mobile app and that'll help you stay connected. Now, here's the latest from FPC. Thanks, you guys. Hey, happy long weekend, everybody. I'm excited about Queen Victoria. I get excited about her every time this year. <laughs> um, I decided, I made a decision today, you guys are my favorites. <laughs> Just wanted you to know, I sometimes think to myself, man, I might be the only one at church today on long weekends. So <laughs> when I arrive and see you all here, I'm excited to see you. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, so you're my favorites. You can take that to the bank. We've decided, uh, we made a dis another decision um, we decided that we are going to start a series today called When the Going Gets Tough. And we thought, man, perfect. It's the long weekend. I'm going to die if I don't move that. Um, we decided a long weekend. Everybody's in a great mood. Got a day off. Time to kick back and relax. So we thought, what better than to start a series on suffering on long weekend? <laughs> And if you don't agree with us on that, then blame Ryan. <laughs> and, he, and really, like, I mean, you can, you can take it up with him. He, he uh, was an advocate for, yeah, long weekend. I think that'd be a great time. We've got to start a series sometime, so it's long weekend. We've got to go with it. And then he's off in the shoe swaps on a houseboat today, so he's not suffering at all. <laughs> Anyways, no, that's awesome. There's a group, our grade 12 grads are away on a trip, and so... Uh, uh, that's great. They're getting a chance to have one last hurrah before the end of school. Um, a few years ago, our lead pastor at the time, uh, Pastor Ta, mentioned to me that he thought that one thing that we needed to do as a church, as Christians, is develop a theology of suffering. And as he talked about that a little bit, and as I've thought about it since then, I, um, I've been more and more convinced that he was right. And it's just sat in the back of my mind for a while, and I've been looking at it, it's been on the radar, and finally today we get a chance to, to dive in and, and tackle it, because I think it is so true. We need to have a theology of suffering, which is to say that we need to understand how God operates vis-a-vis -vis suffering. What is his relationship to suffering? How does that work with God? And so we're going to do that today, and we're going to do that actually over the next three weeks. We're going to look at it from the perspective of Job, and we're going to learn today hopefully a few things from Job himself about suffering. Then next week we're going to look at it from the perspective of his friends and what we can learn through them, and as they spoke into Job's life over the course of a number of chapters. And then... Lastly, we're going to go with the third week and we're going to take a look at suffering from the perspective of God and what God seeks to accomplish in and through suffering and his whole perspective on it. So I'm looking forward to that. I trust that that will be of benefit to you. I think that is something that we really do need to, to come to grips with and, and will benefit from. So I hope that you share in that opinion. Before we dive in this morning, let's just pray and then we'll take a look at this. God, this morning again we stop and we say thank you for the opportunity that we have to know you, to be here together, to talk about you, to learn from you so that we could be more like you. And this morning, Lord, we just would ask that you would come and that you would take this time, that you would help us to lean into you today, that you would help us to expand our understanding of who you are and how you operate, especially in regard to this area of suffering. Lord, we look around and we see suffering. Uh, we've experienced it ourselves. And so... It presents a conundrum for us in so many different ways. Today, would you help us to understand it a little bit better? Would you help us to leverage it a little bit better in our lives as we encounter it? To that end, God, I pray these things and I ask them in your precious name for your son's sake. Amen. All right, so what I want to do is I want to start with the obvious today. Because what I find is when I start with the obvious, then you, you guys don't usually throw rocks as fast. And so... 
Let's start with that. And let's start with the obvious being that we all suffer. Fair? We all suffer. Somewhere, somehow in our lives, we encounter suffering. If you haven't as yet, it's coming soon to a world near you. Somewhere along the way, you will encounter suffering. Now, it can happen in a variety of different ways. Perhaps you're suffering financially. Our economy right now is under some stress from oil prices and things like that. So maybe, maybe you're suffering financially through the loss of a job or something along those lines. Or maybe you're suffering health-wise today. Maybe you had a, a recent diagnosis or you're maybe even awaiting test results. You're even just suffering in anticipation of what those results might be. Or maybe there's something that's been ongoing in your world. You've had a physical disability that causes you to have issues that you have to deal with day in and day out. And you're working through that process every day. Maybe you've got relational struggles. You're suffering in a relationship with a spouse. Things aren't good. Or with a family member, with kids. Maybe you're suffering with a friend who's got an issue with you and is just, there's problems there. Maybe you've got mental suffering. Maybe depression is something that plagues you. And it's just a part of your world and that you have to work your way through. Or maybe you're just an Oilers fan. <laughs> and, well, friends, suck it up. You're just going to have to deal with that one. I don't even know what God would have to say about that. But one way or another, right, we suffer. We encounter some stuff. We have to sled through it. And so the good news this morning is, is that God's aware of that. Jesus acknowledges today that you are going to suffer. John 16 verse 33 says, Jesus speaking here, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. So Christ comes along and right off the hop, like he's just saying, like, man, you're going to have trouble. You're going to have struggles. You're going to suffer through some stuff. And you're thinking to yourself, like, dude, like, how is that good news? Like, if, if God tells us we're going to have struggles, like, that's bad news. Like, whoa, what, what hope is there if God's even saying, well, yeah, no, that's just the way it is. Well, I think that's good news for a couple reasons. Number one, I think it's, a good, it's good news because God does acknowledge that we are going to have struggles, which is to say that he's aware of that. And, and he, he knows that's what's coming. You know, it would be bad news if we wound up one day and woke up one day, I mean, and, and, and all of a sudden all these issues were on our plate and we went to God and said, whoa, you wouldn't believe what's going on in my world. I've got all this stuff going on. And he went, oh, you're right. Didn't see that coming at all. Now that would be bad news. But the fact is, is that he does know, just like Gord said in his welcome this morning, he's walked with you through your week. He knows exactly what's going on. He knew it before you got to this week. He's aware of it. And so if you're like me, when, when I encounter something in my world and I've got difficulties going on, it helps me to be able to go to somebody that knows what I'm going through, that recognizes what's going on in my world, even if they can just commiserate and identify with me, not necessarily even help me specifically, but just, just be there and understand what I'm going through, that's a help. And so that's a help to us today. God is aware. He knows. And he's there for us. We can go and talk to him about it. But it's also good news that he's not just aware of it, but that he has taken our suffering into account. And he is going to 
accomplish something through it. And more than that, he is accounted for it in the end. We're told that one day our sufferings here will pale in comparison to what God has in store for us. Romans 8, verse 18, Paul tells us, I consider our present sufferings, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. What God has in store for us is way far beyond any suffering that we will encounter here in life. So we have that as good news today. God's aware and he's taken it into account. And he tells us that what's coming will make this pale in comparison. So that being the case this morning, maybe we should just leave it at that. All's well that ends well. We're going to suffer. God knows. He's taken it into account. And it's going to work out in the end. <laughs> and I, you know, even as I look out, I can see some people that aren't satisfied with that. Which is great, because I would agree with you. I think to leave it at that is problematic. Problematic for two groups of people. First of all, I think it's problematic for Christians to leave it at that. Secondly, I think it's problematic for non-Christians to just leave it at that. So if you happen to fall into either of those categories today, then great, let's pursue it. Let's persevere on. Because I think God has more for us to understand and know than just that. You know, I think it's insufficient and it's problematic for us as Christians to just leave it as all's well that ends well, because of anybody, we should have an issue with the idea of suffering. It should be a problem for us that there is suffering when we, at once, would say that we have an all-powerful God and an all-loving God. It should be a problem for us in our minds when we purport that God is all-powerful and can do anything, and at the same time, is all-loving. Because that's a problem. How is it that that works? How do you rationalize that? If God is all-powerful, well, then he should be able to step in and solve that problem. And if he's loving, he would be able to step in, or you know, he would want to step in and solve that problem. So when we claim both of those things, we've presented a bit of a conundrum. And for the non-Christian, it's the same. The non-Christian looks around and says, what's up with all this suffering in life? Why, why, is, why are people having to go through all of this stuff? And they look at that and they think to themselves, well, there can't be a God. There must not be a God. Because if there was a God, especially one that claimed to be loving, well then he wouldn't just allow for this. He wouldn't just let it happen. He would step into it. He'd, he'd fix this. So if he's loving, well then I guess he must be all, you know, not all powerful. Must, must not have much ability, because it continues. Or if they look at it and they say, well, well, yeah, there's a God, I guess. But he must not love us. He might be able to do something about it, but he doesn't really care enough to do anything about it, so he can't love us very much. And so they, they look at that and they just, they blow it off and go, you know what? Either A, I don't believe that there is a God, or B, I'm not interested in him because he doesn't seem to be helping out on either level. So I'm going to just do my own thing. He's inconsequential to my life. But if there is a God and He is in fact all-loving and all-powerful as He claims to be, as we would contend that He is, and yet chooses 
to allow for suffering and perhaps even employs suffering for some purpose, to some end, then what's up with that? We need to dig into that and find out what's going on so that we can move forward on a different foundation than the conundrum that is those two paradoxes. Thankfully, we have some insight into this in the book of Job. Some insight that Job didn't have himself. And so we're going to turn there today and we're going to do some reading. I'm going to, again, violate some sort of a speaking rule. And we're going to, rather than just doing a couple of verses, we're going to actually read the majority of chapter 1 and chapter 2. So if you've got your phone or if you uh, didn't bring your phone, you don't have the Bible, download it on your phone. There's a book in front of you, a black book. There's a Bible there. Grab that. I'd encourage you to follow along with us. If you turn to Job, if you're kind of roughly a third of the way from the beginning, third of the way through, you'll hit Job. There's Nehemiah, Esther, Job. If you go to Psalms, you've gone a little bit too far. So we're going to go to chapter 1, and we're going to start and read there. Now, Job is, is a long book. There's 42 chapters, and, and, and so we're going to start and read chapter 1 and 2 because it sets the stage for the rest of the book. And so we're not going to read the whole book today. We're not going to be able to dive into a whole lot more of the, of the book um, this morning. But we're going to start with chapters 1 and 2, and then we'll come to 42 at the end. And just look at a few things from there. So let's read. In the land of Uz, where there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters, and he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, which is to say 1,000 oxen, two in every yoke, and 500 donkeys, and had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. One day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, verse 6, or jumping down to verse 6. And Satan also came with him. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Does God, does, sorry, does Job fear God for nothing, Satan replied? Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But now, stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well then, everything he has is in your power, but on the man himself, do not lay a finger. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. One day, when Job, Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby. And the Sabians attacked and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was speaking, another messenger came and said, The fire of God fell from the heavens and burned up the sheep and the servants, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. And while he was speaking, another messenger came and said, The Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and swept down on your camels and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. And while he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them, and they are dead. And I am the only one who escaped to tell you. At this, Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. 
In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Chapter 2. On another day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came along with them to present himself before them. And the Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on the earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil, and he still maintains his integrity, though you incited me against him to ruin him without any reason. Skin for skin, Satan replied. A man will give all he has for his own life. But now, stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones, and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Very well then, he is in your hands, but you must spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. His wife said to him, Are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. Job replied, You are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all this, Job did not sin in what He said. There's so much that we could unpack in those first two chapters. We're not going to have nearly the time to do it, so we're going to focus on four things going forward. I want to focus on the theology of suffering that is represented here, that Satan uses as the crux of his argument, as his showdown with, uh, of the showdown with God. Then I want to look at three things that we can learn from Job about how he chose to suffer. So we've got this cosmic showdown where Satan shows up in the presence of God one day and God throws Job under the bus. You know, as if Satan hadn't run across him, God brings Job to his attention and says, Hey, have you considered my servant Job? He's amazing. (laughs) <laughs> Satan says, okay, game on. So turn back with me to chapter 1, verse 9, and we're going to see the premise on which Satan chooses to have this showdown with God. Chapter 1, verse 9 says, Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied. Here's the crux of the whole matter. We're going to discuss it. The book goes on and discusses it for the next 42 chapters as Job deals with the results of this challenge. Satan makes the accusation, he makes the assumption that Job is in his relationship with God for something. So his contention here is, does Job fear you for nothing? No, he fears you for something is the implication. And what he's, what he's saying there is that Job is in this relationship and he views it as sort of a quid pro quo. When you do something for me, then I do something for you. So when Job follows God and when he obeys God, then God rewards him. And that's how it works. I scratch you back, your back, you scratch my back. And Satan operates on that contention that that's all that there is to this relationship. It's all a relationship of convenience and opportunity for Job. The whole idea there is called a theology of retribution or recompense. There's a technical term for that. A theology of retribution or recompense. Which is to say that we understand God in those terms. When I do what I'm supposed to, then God 
blesses me. When I do what I'm not supposed to, then he punishes me. And it's false. That's not the only way that God operates. Now, you're saying, well, wait, 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 wait a second, Doug. We find that in the Bible. And you, you even were writing about it this week in your grip blog. About the fact that God came to Solomon and said, hey, dude, remember, when you and the Israelites follow me, I'm going to bless you. And when you step out of line, it's going to get rough for you. Things are going to go bad. So you're right. It is there in the Bible. But Satan comes to us and he uses that same argument over and over so effectively because we see it in the Bible. But the problem is, is that we haven't taken the time to see what else there is in the Bible as well because it also says in the Bible that God is going to reign on the just and the unjust. Send rain up for the just and the unjust. Which is to say, God's going to bless those that follow him and those that don't follow him. And, and now, Job didn't have the benefit of it, but we have the benefit of the book of Job, where we can go and we can see that, whoa, look at this, Job didn't do anything. And yet, he was suffering. So while it does say that when we obey God, that God will bless us. And when we disobey God, then there will be consequences. That's true. But that's not the only axiom that God operates on. That's not the only box that we can put him in. But we want to put him in that box, don't we? That appeals to us as people. And I think that's why it continues to be so effective, a tool for Satan. Because he comes along and says, here's something that you can understand. When you obey what God says, then he'll bless you. And when you disobey him, well, then he's going to punish you. And we look at that and we go, okay, I can wrap my head around that. So I'm okay with that theology. I can, I'll, I'm going to start and operate on that. I'm going to do what God's asked me to do, and I'm not going to do what he doesn't want me to do, because I want him to bless me. And so away we go. And I think it also appeals to us and works effectively for Satan today because it does appeal to us. I like this system because in this system of theology, in this understanding of God, then I can control God. I've got this figured out. I want the blessing. And so therefore, to get the blessing, I will just obey what he says. And then... God has got to do what I want him to do. So in the end, I have a formula now that is going to enable me to get what I want. And so Satan continues to leverage that in our lives. And we come to suffering, and then all of a sudden, now we've got a problem. This, when we encounter undeserved suffering, then we, we look at it and we try and find the answer to it in the same way that Job's friends were starting to to try and direct Job in the same way that Job even tried to rationalize and work it through himself to some extent, where, what's going on? There's, I must have done something wrong. I need to get back and correct that. I'm just going to repent and get past this so that God will bless me again. But that's not all how God operates. We're going to look at, in two weeks, God and how he treats suffering, what he's doing in it. We won't get into that today. So, we need to understand this morning that God isn't operating on that idea of recompense theology. God always deals with this from the perspective of grace. And so, which is to say that even when it comes to when we do things right, then he rewards us. That's awesome. But it comes not because of what we have done. It's come out of his grace. And if he chooses to reward someone and bless someone that hasn't done what they are supposed to do according to God, well, then that's his prerogative as well. He's operating from a perspective of grace. And as opposed to that, on the other side of the coin, God operates from the perspective of grace in his punishment to us because, as some of the friends argued, if you really wanted 
what you deserve, then you'd be in way worse trouble than this. So God is operating from a perspective of grace as well in terms of his punishment. He doesn't give us what we deserve. He would, if he gave us only what we deserve, we would all be dead, done like dinner. So God is always operating from this perspective of grace, and that's the first thing that we needed to understand when it comes from suffering. I think so often we get that wrong. We want to go back to this idea that we can understand and control, where when I do it right, then God blesses me. And when I don't do it right, well, then I find, figure that out and correct it so that he will bless me again. And that's awesome when that turns out to be the case, but it isn't always the case. So we have to be open to a bigger understanding and interpretation of who God is and how he works. Otherwise, we're going to be frustrated because inevitably we come up to a situation in our lives and we don't understand why it's happening. We can't figure out what we've done. To the best of our knowledge, we haven't done what's wrong. We've asked him to show us what's wrong. He's not showing us what's wrong. It's still going on and we have to endure this suffering and it's not making any sense. Only when we figure out that what God does is from grace and what he, that he will use suffering to accomplish something through us and by his grace, then we start to understand, okay, now I've, I've got a better premise to work from here and I'm not going to be at opposition and at odds with myself and who God is and my understanding of him. We need to grow in that perspective, in that theology of God's grace so that we can then have have a better foundation to work our way through suffering. Now, how are we doing? Oh, we're, we're in trouble. I've got three more points. It's the long weekend though, right? So you're not in a hurry? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I do have three more points, but we'll, we'll hustle along here quickly and just wrap up uh, with a few more things. Three things that we can learn specifically about how Job dealt with suffering that can help us. Okay, so first of all, and this is, I'm not, we won't take the time to read it because uh, we're running out of time. Um, you can find these things in chapter 42 in particular. First of all, Job didn't allow his suffering to sever his relationship with God. You know, we see that often, don't we? We see that in our own issues and on a personal level. We're having a disagreement with somebody. Again, might be a friend, might be a child, might be a spouse, whatever. There's friction, there's suffering, there's problems or whatever. And eventually we just say, you know what? I'm done. I'm walking away. I think we also do that with God. Oftentimes. We try and figure him out. We try and wrap our heads around it. And when it doesn't make sense to us and when it doesn't end and when it doesn't come to a satisfactory solution, then we just walk away. You know what? Say, I'm done with this, God. If this is all there is to it, I'm out of here. And we pack up our bags and fold our tents and, and, and we end it. And Job didn't do that. And if there was anybody that had an opportunity or a reason or rationale that was justified, I would think it would have been Job. He'd lost everything and everyone in his world. And then his own health beyond that. He was suffering physically, mentally, all, every which way, emotionally. His friends were beating him up. But the one thing that Job didn't do was he didn't turn his back on God. He continued to engage with God in that process. We find, we see sometimes that he didn't do that very well. We can learn from that as well. But he didn't end the relationship. He didn't turn his back and walk away. We need to keep that in mind. Stick with God. Lean into him at these points. Don't lean back. Number two. Job took his questions and his concerns to God. And he brought them up and wanted to work through them with God. You know, sometimes in our lives, when we have doubts, when we have questions, when we have concerns, then we don't want to talk about those things because we think somehow that's going to be reflective of our faith, that somehow we don't have enough faith. And we, don't, we just kind of try and keep it down, just ignore it. But they're hard to ignore. And, and, you know, it's like sweeping anything under the rug. They don't go away. Usually they just get bigger and worse. And eventually you trip over the rug because there's enough stuff underneath it you can't navigate in your world. 
So when you have questions or concerns or doubts, then just like Job, go to God with them. God's big enough to handle them. He wants to engage with you on them. Now, interestingly, remember from the book, and we read that too, that God did not answer all of Job's questions specifically, which is to say that God doesn't have to come and rationalize and justify himself to us. He is God and we're man. But what God did do in those circumstances, as Job brought his questions, as he brought his doubts, as he brought his concerns, was God showed up and showed Job beyond the questions and concerns and doubts that he was God and that he's got this. And that whatever he decides to do in his sovereignty is all good because I'm God. So I'm not here to justify myself to you, he says. I'm not here to show you, make this make sense to you. Your job, Job, is to recognize who I am. And as that happened, as God showed up in those circumstances, then Job did know who God was. And he learned that God is sovereign. And that the questions now are secondary to the fact that God is who he is. And he's going to do what he's going to do. And it's going to be okay because of that alone. So lean into God with those questions and concerns. Bring him your doubts. Talk to him. Don't sweep him under the rug. Get him out in the open and talk to him about, him, about them. Engage with him in those things. And then watch for him to show up as he demonstrates to you why those questions are secondary and or how he answers them what, however he chooses to use them. Number three. Ultimately, Job did recognize God's sovereignty. And he humbled himself and submitted to God. Man, in our day and age, I think that is so key. We live in this time where it's all about us. Where we can make stipulations and demands and everybody's got to tow the line that I choose for them to tow. We do that as customers. You know, we... we the customer's always right. I walk in, I don't like the way it's working here, I tell you, it's your job to change. I don't like the way my kid's being treated at school. Well, it's obviously not a problem with my child, it is something that is wrong with the school. Therefore, you better figure this out, sort it out, change it, because I just told you that there's a problem and you need to fix it. It is at work. I don't like the way that you run this show. So I'm here to tell you that you need to change the way that you run your operation because I don't like it. You know, is that not right? We need to recognize that not only in those situations in our lives, but in particular, primarily with God, that we do not show up and tell him the way that this goes down. We don't, we don't make demands of God. You show up and you tell me how this makes sense in your scheme of justice. Job came to that point where he looked around and he said, Oh, God, I have been wrong. I have been out of line. I apologize. I repent. I understand you better now. I understand you differently than I did before. Forgive me for my impetuous wrong attitude, my wrong perspective, and help me to come in line with who you are. And God then, in this circumstance, chose to step in and restore him in every way. But God will step into your circumstance and he will meet you in that as well as we humble ourselves and learn and grow from who he is and about who he is in our understanding of who he is. We're going to take a look next week at Job from the perspective of the friends, what we can learn about how they tried to help Job or not help Job as the case may be. And then the week after that, we're going to look at this whole perspective of suffering from God's eyes and his viewpoint and what we can understand about what God does with suffering and why he chooses every once in a while maybe to throw somebody under the bus like Job. Let's pray. And then we'll be dismissed. Father, this morning, again, we stop and we just recognize you and acknowledge you as God. 
God, you are so far beyond us. You're so much bigger than we are and forgive us when we try and bring you down to our level and put you in a box that we can, that we can control, that we can understand, that we can manipulate for our own purposes and our own agendas. God, in the world around us, there's lots of suffering. In our lives, we even see suffering. Would you help us to understand suffering in different ways today? That we would have a different perspective of it. That we would adopt a stance where we know that you are using it for a purpose. And that it is always tempered by your grace. That whatever suffering that we're going through, it will not be beyond our ability to bear with your help. And that you will use it to accomplish different things in our lives. And that it's only by your grace that we don't get even worse suffering than we deserve. Than, uh, than, than we get. That we don't get suffering that we really do deserve on a level that we deserve because of what we've done. Thank you for that, that you're graceful to us in that regard. And God, lastly, I would just pray for those that are in the midst of suffering right now, that you would show up in their circumstance, that they would lean into you today with whatever the issue is, that they would pursue you in their suffering, that they would be able to find you and that you would demonstrate yourself as sufficient for them in that. And that even if you choose not to answer all of their questions as to why and what's up, that you would nonetheless give them the assurance to know that you are using it for purposes that are significant, that are just, and that will accomplish more grace in their lives and the world around us. So I pray for them that you would bless them. I ask these things now in your son's name. Again, for your sake, amen. Thanks again for coming out on the long weekend. Look forward to seeing you next week.